um, helping growing software companies build their security programs. So that's kind of what I, uh, the flavor that I'm coming from. Also, I was recently impacted by layoffs, so if you like what you hear, come talk to me afterwards. Um, so today we're talking about why data breaches aren't like plane crashes, but should be. So I've got a little story to start off. Um, maybe. Oops, maybe not. What happened to my... All right. Um, on October 29th, 2018, a Boeing 737 MAX departed from Jakarta on a routine domestic flight in Indonesia. Shortly after takeoff, the pilot struggled to maintain control of the aircraft. The nose of the plane started to continually pitch downward. Um, after a few minutes, the, plane, the pilot lost total control and the plane crashed into the sea. Unfortunately, it killed all 189 people on board. The flight only lasted 13 minutes. Just a few months later, on March 10th, 2019, a second Boeing 737 MAX ran into a similar issue. This one was operated by Ethiopian Airlines and it left Nairobi, Kenya. The flight immediately had the same issue. The pilot started to lose control of the plane. The nose started to pitch downward. He eventually lost control and it crashed, killing all 157 people on board within six minutes. These two accidents uh, made international news. It was very quick. People from all over the world combined from international groups, civilian, law enforcement, airline manufacturers, airline operators, all cooperating together to figure out what happened. The Boeing 737 has been flying in some version since the 60s. How do two airplanes crash on opposite sides of the world with totally different people involved? So they feared mechanical problems. As a result, within several days of the, accident, the second accident, the global fleet of 737 MAXs was grounded. Not a single plane would fly for more than a year and a half. Uh, Boeing estimated that the cost of the groundings was around $18 billion. So what happened as a result of all of these different agencies collaborating together? Well, they discovered that the root cause was a combination of several things. Poor training, software errors, mechanical failures, and dangerous marketing. So the, the 737 MAX is a newer version of the 737. The biggest difference is that the engine is a little larger. That means it's a little more fuel efficient and it's cheaper to operate. Boeing advertised this as basically saying, this is the exact same plane you're used to, just cheaper. You don't need to have a lot of new parts. You don't need to have dramatic new training for your crews on how to fly it because it's basically the same airplane. That wasn't entirely true. The larger engine caused a change in aerodynamics. What they found is that during takeoff, when you're operating at your fastest acceleration, sometimes the nose of the plane would pitch upwards and you'd risk a dangerous stall. Rather than trying to solve the problem through aerodynamics or training, they decided to use software to fix it. So they created a software system that would measure the, uh, take a sensor on the front, that would measure what they call the angle of attack or the pitch of the aircraft. If it ever detected that it was pitching up too high, the tail flaps of the plane would automatically activate and cause the nose to come downward. Now what's interesting is that the pilots did not need to take any intervention for this to happen. It happened automatically. And in many cases, pilots might not even be aware that this software existed. They found that some pilots who were flying the 737 MAX only had two hours of training on the MAX specifically via an iPad. In both of these plane crashes, the sensor on the front malfunctioned and it, the plane thought that it was pitching upwards too high when in actuality it was already within a safe path. So the, um, the tail flap started to push it downward which eventually caused it to plummet to the ground. In the case of the Ethiopian Airlines, the pilot actually recognized that this was happening and deactivated the software but by then it was too late. Um, so as a result of all of this, they had to make a lot of changes. So they, they applied these fixes. So first, they did an update to the software. So they did a hot fix, a patch. Um, they improved the diagnostic lights in the cockpit or improved the UI. They also increased training on the crew and provided the ability for pilots to override this, this software very, very quickly. So in other words, they changed their technologies, processes, and training when operating the aircraft. 
And what's really significant that I want to focus on here is this wasn't one company that did a post-mortem and then figured out how to make these changes. This was every operator of the 737 MAX in the world. And that's how the airline, op airline industry operates, right? When a crash happens, there's a lot of attention to it. You probably remember somewhere in the back of your mind hearing about these 737 MAX in the news from a few years ago. People look at it. There's a tremendous amount of transparency. The fact that I can tell you about all of this, even though I'm not in the aircraft industry, and that you can go onto the Wikipedia articles and read down to the second what happened in a plane crash shows how transparent and open they are. And then the entire industry elevates themselves as a result of each plane crash. So as a result of all of this, the, um, it's a tragedy that those folks lost their lives. But all the other flights that are flying the 737 MAX and new airline designers, in a very real sense, are now safer because of that loss. And over the course of doing this for more than 100 years of airline flight, the airline industry is incredibly safe. The odds of an American getting into a plane crash in any year is 1 in 11 million. Compare that with the odds of you getting struck by lightning sometime in your lifetime is around 1 in 3,000. So it's dramatically less. Um, and it's, we, we have this safety net that's paid for with the blood of the people who came before us. Now imagine, on the other hand, if the airline industry treated plane crashes like security incidents. Right? So here's a fictional notification from a not real plane crash, but this is what I imagine it would look like. Um, we regret to inform you that earlier this year, between March 10th and 23rd, we suffered a safety incident. Between 100 and 300 people may have been impacted. Many of those may have suffered minor injuries. Oops, what happened again? Um, an unknown number may have suffered loss of life or limb. We have hired expert consultants to figure out what went wrong and to prevent future incidents. In coming months, those impacted will be contacted above and beyond what's required by law and receive credit monitoring. And most importantly, your safety is important to us. Um, so, so what? Why am I talking about airline security in a, um, in a security conference? Well, even though we're not in the airline industry, I think there's things that we can learn from it. We have, um, it's good to look at other industries and take, and take a good thought, uh, a good hard think about how we do things compared to them. Data breaches are happening at what seems to be an increasing rate. And um, every data breach that happens is really a lesson for the rest of the industry. In a perfect world, every time a data breach would happen, we would know exactly how it happened, and then we could take corrective action to prevent all of our companies from having the same fate. In that world, we would never have the same data breach twice, right? We would all correct it, and we wouldn't have to go through it again. Now, information security is not the same as the airline industry. There's a lot of different reasons why. For one, the risk tolerance of human lives compared to somebody's address is very, very different. But I think there's some things that we can take from it. So what, what can we do specifically? Um, I would propose that we should learn from, from security events, security things that happen. Uh, when I was first starting to learn about security, and I wanted to make a career out of it, I was a college student, and I only had like one or two classes on security, so I read security news. And as that went on, anytime I'd come across a term I didn't know, I would just Google it. And you know, what's a SQL injection? What's a CVE? What are all these different things? And I found that within about six months, I was generally security literate. Like I could have conversations. I didn't know a lot, but I could understand things, I knew that I'd really started to make it when I started to feel that warm blanket of cynicism wrap around me. So what I'm proposing that we do here, that you do, is to learn from other people's dumb mistakes, right? Let's take a look at the data breaches that have happened. How do we draw those lessons out and apply them to ourselves and our company? Experience is really the best teacher, but having a data breach is really hard-earned experience. You don't really want to go through that. And we talk a lot about the technical side of things. But one of the other side effects is when you, when you pick apart how people handle the data breach, you also see all the horrible PR moves that they had. And you can help your companies not do the same ones, because they may have never thought about it before. So um, what we're going to do is I'm going to go over two different stories from actual data breaches that happened in the last couple of months, how they happened, and some lessons that we can take from them. Now, a lot of times you have to make some guesses based on limited information. So I'm not presenting all of this as factual. I'm going to make some educated guesses. And that's totally fine, right? We're not in a trial. We're not trying to sue them. 
Um, we're just trying to learn, and I think that's great. So first one we have is Uber. You guys all know about the Uber data breach that happened this year. There was a lot to say about that. Um, so on September 15th of this year, Uber suffered a data breach. It's believed to be the work of a teenager located in the United Kingdom who is associated with the Lapsus hacking group. Lapsus has made the news a lot. They are primarily um, teenagers in the United Kingdom. They started late last year and have been very successful at breaching a large number of brands such as Microsoft, NVIDIA, Verizon. Uh, but what's interesting about them is they're teenagers, so they like attention. And uh, they talk a lot about what they do. And so this guy also talked a lot about what he did. So a lot of what I'm going to go through is based on comments that he made publicly to journalists um, and, and, and other people. I think it tells a consistent story because you look at the statements that Uber has made, and it largely lines up. Um, some internal folks at Uber also said some things that probably you know maybe they shouldn't have that corroborate this as well with some screenshots and things like that. So I think that this is largely true from what happened. So. What, what, is, what is the breakdown? So the attacker first found a contractor who worked at Uber and sent him a phishing email, just generic phishing email, got username and password for the company's VPN. But the VPN was protected by multi-factor authentication. Fantastic, great. Uh, he tried to log in and it didn't work. It sent a little push notice to the contractor whose credentials that belonged to that said, hey, you tried to log in, was this you? Yes or no? Well, he didn't click yes. So the attacker tried it again, and again, and again, and again, and his phone just kept getting spammed with all of these notices. Some journalists said that there was just some fatigue, and the guy eventually just clicked yes. The hacker actually claimed that the contractor never did that. He followed up with the contractor on WhatsApp, said, I am Uber IT. Um, we are having some problems with our messages. You may have gotten a bunch of notices. If you just click once yes, they'll stop, which is true. Um, so he did click yes, and then the attacker was in. He was off to the races. He immediately found a network drive that was mapped that contained a PowerShell script with hard-coded admin credentials to their privileged access management system. Right? Not, uh, not that great. Um, so a privileged access management system, that's like a password manager. So he had all of the passwords, admin passwords, might I add, to many of the SaaS applications that Uber was working with. So what did he get access to? Well, he got source code. He got AWS and GCP admin for at least some accounts and projects. He got G Suite admin. He got domain admin. He got vSphere admin. He got financial dashboards, all of which he posted screenshots of online. He got access to Sentinel-1 so he could remote control laptops. He got access to their Slack admin and started making posts in their Slack taunting Uber. He said, attention, Uber's been breached, and I am the attacker. He then put all sorts of updates on what happened. Now, the people at Uber were so confused by this that they started, they thought it was a joke, and they started posting SpongeBob SquarePants memes and all sorts of other things. Well, security did not think it was a joke and told everybody, hey, nobody's allowed to log into Uber Slack right now. Not sure what that was trying to do, but hey, they were trying to come up with something, right? Um, my personal favorite is he got into their Hacker One account and made this public post. You can see it's coming from Uber, so he's disclosing his own breach on Hacker One. Uber's been hacked, and this Hacker One account has been hacked also. Uh, there's a lot of people who've had some hot takes and poked fun at um, Uber. This one's my personal favorite I found, Chris Powell. Uber's threat intelligence is amazing. They had the attacker on their own Slack providing minute-by-minute -minute attack updates. <laughs> so, you know, we like to poke a little fun at, at Uber here. Um, you know, they had, I, I feel bad for those folks. They've got a lot of work to clean up. Um, they didn't do everything wrong. They did some things right. But in this case, Uber is our teacher. So great Uber, what can you teach us? So here's four takeaways that I thought were interesting. Um, they're not, you could probably grab a few others, but here's the ones that I like. First off, hard-coded credentials are dangerous, no joke. Um, they would have a totally different scenario if they didn't have hard-coded credentials. Um, and, and we all here know that, that you shouldn't put credentials, API tokens in GitHub, but do your developers know that? And if I did ask one of your developers or engineers, and they knew not supposed to put it there, could they answer where it is supposed to go? If they can't give you that answer, what's your company policy for where to store secrets? You've got work to do. Uh, limit access to sensitive information. Nine times out of 10, when there's a data breach, somebody didn't follow the principle of least privilege. And that happened here as well. Let's just say for an instant that, that um, the, script with pow the PowerShell script with hard-coded credentials was necessary for whatever reason, right? How many people should have had access to that? Like, three, maybe four people in the whole company. 
What are the odds that that was the case and this teenager just happened to fish a contractor who was one of those four people? I think that's unlikely. So I'm going to go on and guess and say that that script was broadly available to way too many people inside Uber. So they should have had limited access to that. Um, ensure contractors have security training. People forget about contractors a lot of time. This contractor was socially engineered. Did he have training about how to prevent social engineering? Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. But I'm sure everybody thinks he should have a little more now. Um, Who's providing that training? Is that you? Is that the contracting company? Put it into your contract. How is it going to be tracked? How is it going to be managed? What happens if they don't do the training? All things to think about. And last, but I think most important, today's frontier is identity and access management. It used to be, you know, your firewall was the edge of your network, and then all of your data was in this database. And once you got into the network, it was kind of a GUI center. Yeah, that's, that's 20 years ago. Nowadays, is our data in databases? Some of it is, but most of it's in SaaS applications. Our customers' data is in all sorts of different SaaS applications, our CRMs, our data marts, uh, third-party managed databases, all sorts of things like that. How do we get access to those? Usernames and passwords. So our firewalls today are usernames and passwords. So do you know what SaaS applications have your customers' data? Do you know how those are protected? Do they have multi-factor? Are people getting off-boarded? Are people getting on-boarded? That's just as important today as writing good firewall rules. So. Um, Uber had some great things going. They did have some management of it, but obviously they could do a little bit of true up with their password management, uh, especially now. All right, next lesson. So this one is coming from the city of Detroit. I like this one because it's a small one and it demonstrates that we can learn lessons from small companies as well. So this last summer, Detroit had a, um, they launched a new retirement website, right? And any employee of the city of Detroit could access it. So it wasn't publicly on the internet, but it also was, um, broadly accessible. So on the first day that it launched, they had a, a man came in and he started looking around at the different things and he found on the home page links to a bunch of different other pages. And one of those pages contained a spreadsheet that had the names, birth dates, and social security numbers of his coworkers. Right? He looked at that and said, well, that's not right. Um, he could have contacted his sysadmin and just said, hey, can we clean this up? And maybe he did. But he also contacted Fox News. Fox News local affiliate ran an article about it, and I read that article, which is how I know about it. And basically, the uh, city of Detroit claimed we, we hired experts to come in, clean it up. Um, wouldn't you know it, we did have some data exposed, but only one person read the data that wasn't supposed to. And they read 68 people, they're going to get credit monitoring, um, and we considered the case closed. So a couple of things to pick out about this. I think uh, the PR part is interesting. What are the odds that one person uh, actually read that when it was available to all employees and it just happened to be the one person who reported it to the newspaper. You kind of have to read between the lines on these. A lot of times companies will say there's no evidence that more than one person was impacted. And that may be true, but maybe that's because there's no evidence because they didn't log it. So I think that logging is, uh, that's, security logging is an important thing. That's number nine in the OWASP top 10, insufficient security logging and monitoring. So auditing can really save you in a data breach. It can help change the conversation from one person was impacted to up to a million people were impacted and we just don't know. The other thing obviously is security testing. Any amount of security testing would have caught this, right? Don't put data that's out uh, that sh uh, to, to people who it shouldn't have access to. So broken access controls, number one in the OWASP top 10. So when you're writing out your software, you should have security tests that are specifically testing for broken access controls. Have a positive person who should access data or perform an API action. Have somebody who's authenticated or maybe even unauthenticated try to perform the action and make sure that they can't. So those are a couple of lessons. Um, people often ask me, how do you find these stories? There's the perception that companies are tight-lipped and they won't tell you anything, which is true in a lot of cases, but you'd be surprised at how much is publicly available just by reading through the internet. Here's a list of places to go through. I put them in order, the ones that I like the best. Uh, leave it up here so you can take a screenshot if you like. Industry reports are great to start with. Verizon and IBM do a report every year where they aggregate data from thousands of companies. They won't tell you specific stories, but they'll tell you general trends. For example, do you know how much a data breach costs for a company in your industry and your size? Because you should, because that's how you get budget. Um, so those are great to read. Google News is my favorite. Literally just type in data breach and see what comes up. You can put filters saying just show the last six months uh, or whatever you'd like. You'll learn really quickly that some places just aren't even worth your time to look at. So if it's from a healthcare, hospital, finance, like they're not going to tell you anything. Um, Twitter is great. I, it's kind of weird right now, I guess. Twitter is a little weird, so we'll see if it's still great in a couple of months. But um, a carefully curated Twitter feed 
with people commenting on security incidents will tell you about security incidents before they become mainstream news. So how do you get those people? Search on, I mean, find people you like, but search on Twitter for data breach and see who's making pithy comments, follow them, and then look at who they follow. Similarly, come to a conference like this. If you like somebody who's speaking, go ahead and follow them and look at who they follow. Sometimes it's nice to have two different Twitter accounts, one that's just for consuming security news and then one for everything else, so that way they don't get all jumbled. I've messed that up, so if you follow me on Twitter, I'll show you my handle at the end. I get a bunch of like NHL stuff in my feed when I'm looking at security stuff, which, because I like the NHL. But um, a couple of tech sites that are great. Krebs on security, I love him. He's a journalist who does security things. Um, so he does a lot of investigative reporting. So he doesn't do as much commentary on the engineering side, but a lot of connecting the dots. The register.co.uk is a great one too. I don't hear people talk about that one as much. They're based in the UK, so they tend to focus on European affairs a little bit more, but they're very cheeky. They're also very technical. Um, so they write some clever articles. And uh, if you read about a major breach in like CNN or some of these other things, they never tell you how it happened, just what happened, because their audience doesn't care. Go check over the register. They might have a good write-up. And last but not least, the Equifax Congressional Report. Um, that's one data breach, but it's probably the most well-documented data breach in human history. Go ahead and read the report. It's like 100 pages long, but probably only about 20 of it is what you guys would care about. It's surprisingly accessible, but goes into tremendous detail of all of the technical and organizational failures. So if you've got some mid-level managers who don't want to patch their servers, show them that report and show how the organizational failures there contributed to the breach. Um, so a good security engineer can secure their own company, or a good security professional helps to secure their own company. A great security professional helps teach others to secure the company. And I think that you should spend a lot of your time talking to the people and evangelizing security to them. So I would say that we can learn a lot from these security stories, but I think others can learn a lot from them as well. There's something that's just built into our DNA about teaching lessons through stories. That's why the fables are so, so popular after so many hundreds of years. It's a lot easier to have a conversation with somebody that says, hey, we shouldn't do this because Uber did this last week and they got breached, rather than a whole bunch of theoreticals. Um, so I think that you should use these stories and reach out. One way that I've done this before, and this is just my little adaptation to it, you can take from it what you want, is the last two places I worked for about two years, we've had a monthly meeting at the end of every month um, on a Friday, and we just talk about security news. We called it Who Got Hacked? And I'll go through and I'll find a list of three to five stories of somebody who got, of people who got hacked in the last five months. And we just, really basic. What happened? So this Uber story was one of them. Uh, what, what could they have done to prevent it? And how do we stack up? Are we making the same mistakes? Or do we have controls in place that would prevent it as well? Right, so you can have some real frank discussions. And sometimes engineers don't know uh, that we have controls in place and it's good to educate them on it. So this has been very successful for us. Um, you really, uh, we, we've had, let's see, my last place, we had a, around 150 engineers, and uh, we would typically have between 15 and 30 engineers show up every month. It's basically an hour of secure developer training, right? How hard is it to get them to sit through one meeting a, a, for one hour a year? And we had people voluntarily coming and discussing it, and they, they loved it. But you gotta make it interesting, right? This could get really dry really fast. So we did all sorts of things to make it fun, or else people would never come back. So we held trivia contests. Um, we did security poetry. Uh, companies only ever get hacked for like six reasons. So we did uh, bingo with cards at all the reasons they got hacked. Um, YouTube videos, played video games. Um, we did a family feud day. So here's, we did it on Zoom, so I took a screenshot. I had this fantastic gold sequin suit. And we gave away prizes with our family feud, uh, all themed based on this, the, the um, incidents that we talked about that day. Um, one time we talked about Facebook. And so I told them that I interviewed an insider at Facebook that had some extra information to talk about their data breach. And this was a video. Um, Mark Zuckerberg had a lot to say. So that was a lot of fun. Anyway, so what are our takeaways? We're wrapping up here. Uh, read up on current security events, learn from every event, and use that to teach others. And now I wanted to make sure that um, I, I preach what I teach. So I got to make sure that I'm not boring as well. Um, so uh, I'm not much of a musician, but you guys weren't expecting anything anyway, so your, your expectations are low. So this is, this is one of the things that I did in one of our presentations, just a little, I guess, like security poem that I, I, I read to them while we, were, while we were getting introduced to the idea. Keeping data safe is hard to do. There will always be bad people who are clever, dedicated, and try hard to 
defraud, steal, or bypass our guard. To stay safe from the bad guys, why not learn from those who are less wise? You can read about their stories in the news about the CEOs and managers whose failed policies, processes, and tools have led the lawsuits, best practices, and rules that we can discuss, analyze, and use. So sit back, but stay on track as we talk about who got hacked. Thank you. Uh, great, so out of time now, so we've got questions, you can come up and find me also. Like I said, I'm open for work, so love cloud security and if, uh, AppSec, so if you've got some need, uh, talk to me. Thank you.